Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. We're continuing on with Mark Headley, blown for good. Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Hey, today's a special show. We're going to talk about all things Tom Cruise. Oh, goody. Where do you want to start? Uh, well, I guess probably just from the beginning, uh, as, as long as uh, what I know, which was uh, st- starts back in 1990, and Tom Cruise was getting more and more into Scientology. Um, his wife at the time, Mimi Rogers, had sort of introduced him uh, to Scientology, and he got I think he actually got some auditing from her dad, if I remember correctly. Um, and he sort of, as soon as it was kind of known that he was in and he was interested, then it was sort of like showtime. This guy can't be going to some mission in Riverside or Celebrity Center. He needed to be at the base, and he needed to be coddled and and sort of uh, uh, you know handled uh, so that everything went perfectly. And in RTC, there's a gentleman by the name of Greg Wilhair. And Greg Wilhair was, I think at the time, his post was corporate liaison in charge in RTC. And it was sort of like a post that was set up so that somebody in RTC could deal with the other corporations in Scientology. So legally, no one from RTC was, you know, managing any of these other groups. It was sort of just on paper, a legal thing they needed. Sure. But, um, and I think before Greg Wilhair, I think Mark Fisher was uh, CLIC, if I'm uh, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, um, Greg Wilhair was the guy that was assigned to be Tom Cruise's handler. Now, Mark, that's an interesting point. Just for a moment, can you explain what a handler is and does in the Church of Scientology? Basically, if Tom Cruise is this big movie star and he's going to get into Scientology. It, uh, we need to we need to manage this thing so that nothing goes wrong, and if something does g- go wrong, it can be handled uh, instantly. So that Tom Cruise's Scientology experience is the most perfect thing that could possibly happen. So, so, so basically, um, this person is directed on exactly what to do with Tom. And then they report up. They send a daily report that goes to David Miscavige. And then David Miscavige can then judge based on that day, okay, good, this is what you need to do tomorrow or all next week and and sort of uh, caress and coddle Tom so that every little thing is the next thing he should do so that every experience that he has is a positive one so that he he doesn't leave Scientology. Could you call this love bombing? Would that be fair? Well, I mean that's pro- that's pro- that's part of it. I mean they're they're trying to overwhelm him with how awesome everything is and how awesome he is and how awesome he's going to be in Scientology and how much this is going to help him and whatever he needs, we're here for you. And I mean even on Days of Thunder, so Greg Wilhair is was hanging out with him on the set of Gr- Days of Thunder. So it's not like. Uh, Greg Wilhair goes and sees him for five minutes and says, how's it going? No, no, Greg Wilhair is like with him while he's shooting. Wow. And then, and then they, t- they, they tell him about this clear sound technology, which is this revolutionary audity, uh, uh, audio recording technology that Elwin Hubbard invented. And so they built a special recording rig. It's actually called the clear sound rig. And this recording rig had all of the latest and greatest digital and analog equipment for capturing on-set sound for a movie. And they sent this rig to the set of Days of Thunder so that all of Tom Cruise's dialogue would be recorded on this particular rig. And, I mean, that's, and this, this is a $100,000 recording rig. It's not just like a, a few things thrown together. I mean, this thing was custom made specifically for Tom Cruise. It actually had – it was these road showcases with all this rack-mounted audio gear and a, a, what's called a Nagra D, which is like a Nagra uh, digital recorder and a, uh, this super-duper analog na- uh, Nagras. And, and it actually had nameplates on it that said Tom Cruise. It was Tom Cruise's personal recording rig. 
Amazing. Did it work? Did clear sound work? Well, they they got booted the the hell off the set. The the union sound guys were having none of it. They were like, no, no, you can take this thing and shove it. We're going to record the way we've always recorded. So it was a very short lived idea that uh, Tom Cruise was going to revolutionize the uh, the sound the on set sound recording with his L. Ron Hubbard clear sound rig. <laughs> Mark, Mark, just to digress, do you know that David Miscavige has a vanity patent on a microphone? Yeah, on the, the lapel mic. Yeah, I know about that. Yeah, and then uh, the other funny thing is Tom did an interview in the early 90s, if I recall, where he called the Hollywood Sound people like an – he called them an old bunch of guys who don't know what they're doing. And he just – Tom said, I just want clarity on the voice. Yeah. Is that asking too much? Yeah, that, that, and, was, in, uh, that was all in relation to this clear sound rig fiasco. Okay, so anyway, so, so that, this is all yeah. happening in 1990, and I mean, Greg was on the set so much on that movie that one of the doctors, one of the characters, uh, one of the doctors who is examining uh, the race car drivers, if you if you look in IMDb or if you watch the movie, they actually changed his name to Doctor Wilhair in the movie. <laughs> I mean, okay, that's so how much. Say. Greg was there. They changed one of the character names to Will Hare as a joke, you know, Amazing. and sort of a high five to Greg. But at this point, Dave Miscavige and Tom Cruise had not yet become best buds. It was sort of like Tom's in Scientology. We're going to send this this guy from RTC, Greg Will Hare, who's a he's a he's a personable guy, um, and he's like a PRE type of guy, you know. He's He's, yeah. the, the, he's the guy you send in to kind of smooth things over. So um, so Greg is sort of the dude hanging out with Tom. And during the shooting of that movie, it became very apparent that Tom and Nicole were a thing. So it was very important to get Mimi out of the picture because Tom likes Nicole. Nicole's like another, you know, 10, 11 young, years younger than Mimi. So, and Nicole's like, you know, she's just a young hot, hot something. She's just like, you know, we can get her to do whatever we want to do. Now, Mark, is this, this whole thing, so our listeners know, knowledge reports would be written by Greg Wilhelm and others to David Miscavige. Knowledge reports on all this? No, no, not knowledge reports. No. Daily, no. daily reports. Ooh, even more. So, so highly. So basically. Okay. Dave Miscavige has – he micromanages every single aspect of Scientology. So any activity or project or sector of Scientology has – whoever's in charge of it, whoever's the you know, boots-on-the-ground guy who's running that thing, writes a daily report and forwards it up to their higher-up, and then that higher-up compiles all their areas. And all of these reports end up with David Miscavige. And in, okay, so in cases like this, it just goes direct to David Miscavige. There's no, there's no in between. There's no go between between Greg Wilhair and David Miscavige. It's going straight to Dave. Okay, so Mimi's out and Nicole's in. They got to make that happen. How do they do it? Well, that's when at this point we had been at the base. We had been renovating and making the property just this, just basically a luxury oasis, and. The, there were all these bungalows that were being renovated so that Tom could come and stay in there and just be a luxurious getaway for him that no one could get into. It's basically – it's like a private resort, but he would be the only person there you know, living it up. There's nobody else, – everybody else is there just to service him. So he'd have his own chefs. He'd have his own motorcycle to drive around the property. He'd have his own bungalow. We had – Tennis courts, basketball fields, uh, basketball courts, uh, soccer fields, an exercise gym, um, this field where they could uh, – him and Nicole could run through the field. Um, there was a rose garden, uh, like a little walking garden built right next to the bungalows. Um, you name it, anything and everything so that him and Nicole – because it's basically – now it's not just Tom who's coming. Nicole's coming with him. So no. – your tax exempt dollars at work. Now, the story about the field of daisies that you guys had to plant, what happened on the field of daisies that That's just part of this whole thing. For some reason, 
the media latched onto the daisies part of it, but it was it was all of these things. This entire area of the property was a dust bowl before Tom Cruise came, and because he was coming, it was pimped out. And it's the it's part of the property. There was nothing at this time in 1990. There was nothing over on this side of the property. It was you would have to drive through fields and fields of nothing to dirt, just a, a little road to get. To this area of the property, it was very secluded uh, area where nothing else had been developed there. So, when, when right before he came, there were all these G units, which are these uh, bungalows, the guest units. Then you had the tennis courts, which are right there, the rose garden, the fields, the uh, soccer fields, the exercise gym the basketball courts, the par course, which was this like an exercise course that had all these stations where you could stop and, you know, balance, run on a balance beam, do some chin-ups, do some pull-ups, yeah. rings, all this stuff. This was all installed during this time. And up until this point, there was nothing like that for the crew. None of this stuff was there. It was the only thing they had at the base up until that point was – the, the running track where you, you know, you run around the palm tree and then the, the clipper ship, which had a pool in the middle of it. So that was the only sort of like, you know, recreational type uh, parts of the property that were there. So you guys build all these amenities largely for Tom and Nicole's upcoming visit. Yeah, there were, I mean, the amount of time I was there for 15 years and I would say, gosh. I, I think I played maybe two games of soccer on that soccer field. And those were uh, like one day of the year. And then like a few years later, we played a soccer game there. We didn't play what it was these soccer fields. There were probably years where not a single soccer game were, were played on those fields by the, well, by the base of, crew. Sure. You had a lot of work to do. You had no time to play soccer and <laughs> the deadly serious activity of Scientology. But g- going back and just – just you have to indulge me and our listeners here. Tom Cruise wanted a field of daisies to run through with Nicole, and you got to tell the story, Mark. Come on, the field of daisies. Well, I mean that's what I'm saying. It was just lumped in with all this other stuff, so it wasn't. But, it wasn't like for us, it was a package. It wasn't like we're gonna. Oh. I don't know. You know, it was like, like even when I heard about it after I left, I was like, well, yeah, we built. Yeah, there was a field, and there was sports fields and that's why i think it just kind of got latched on to as sort of this you know this thing like oh him and nicole are gonna <laughs> he said he wanted to run through a field of daisies it might have even been a joke and so so what do we need to do <laughs> we need to plan a field of daisies so it's sort of like well i don't even know that tom even knew about all this stuff it was sort of like Hey, come over and check this out. And then when he gets there, we're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we've got sports fields. Oh, yeah, yeah, you want to play soccer? Oh, yeah, you want to play basketball? You want to play tennis? It was sort of like, yeah, yeah, we've got all this stuff here. We got everything you need. That stuff wasn't there six months ago, dude. It, we, it was made for you. But no, now here's I, the it, other thing. When he came and he yeah. showed up with Nicole, they were like little kids just playing around the property. I mean, he, I was there one morning, I was on the night shift. Uh, in the manufacturing building. And so one morning, like really early in the morning, this car carrier just rolls into the property with a brand new Mercedes on it. Like, you know, like whatever the most pimped out, awesome sports Mercedes of 1990 there was, that's the one that was on the car carrier. And it got rolled up. The guy unloads it from the thing, and Tom brings Nicole down there. And it's like, ha, 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 ha. Like it was just a present for her. He just had this wow. car delivered to the property for her as a – I don't know if it was a birthday present or whatever. But he was riding his motorcycle around and kind of driving up to her real fast and then stopping just short of her. And she's like, ah, screaming. And, I mean, they were literally like little kids just playing around and <laughs> making out. And it was just like, wow, okay, you know, I guess we're just here for you guys. You know, don't worry about us. We're just, you know, we've just been working all night. You know, you guys just have your uh, fun and, and romp and play, as Tom would say. Sure. <laughs> but, um, so, but that is also the time when basically him and Tom, uh, Nicole and Tom, are going to stay there. 
They're going to live at the property, and this is when Nicole's going to get some auditing, and she's going to do some training on Scientology, and Tom is going to do his Scientology training. And that's kind of how I got to know Tom more than I would have just from, you know, a, just happening to see him here or there is because he needed somebody who hadn't had that much Scientology training or auditing. And that was that when you're, when you're first in Scientology doing your training, you basically need a guinea pig that you can practice your auditing on. You can practice the Scientology counseling techniques on. And so I was actually chosen to be that guinea pig for him. And so we did all this, you know, introductory auditing, um, and the funny thing was is that I had actually already had all of the auditing that Tom Cruise gave me. I got it when I was like 13 or 14 uh, when I was actually in Clearwater with my friend. We kind of gone there on a semi-vacation, and his dad was like, well, you guys got to go on course a little bit here and there. And there was some auditor lady there at, at, in Florida that needed a guinea pig, and she sort of did – and she did all the same auditing. Uh, you know, this is probably – I don't know, six, seven years prior to this, prior to me joining the C organization and being at the international headquarters. But um, so it was, it was like, it was sort of like a little bit of a cheat that he could do it with me because I'd already had it, but I hadn't really done any, any other auditing since then. So it's sort of like, okay, we'll just get a little refresher and Tom will do it. And then that way it'll give him a little bit of an edge. So he doesn't have to deal with somebody who's just total, you know, what they call raw meat. He has somebody who's kind of indoctrinated, but hasn't really done anything else. So we were doing this, you know, every, every day I'd go over and get some auditing and it wasn't really that memorable. I think the most memorable thing that happened for me at least was that in one of the sessions I actually fell asleep. Like it was so, I was so bored out of my mind. They call it uh L. Ron Hubbard calls it uh, what Anaton. Anaton, yeah. I would, I yeah. went, I went Anaton from from just the repetitive nature of the the Scientology auditing, and I literally just like while Tom Cruise was asking me questions, I just literally went to sleep. <laughs> have, a big, have, have a big movie star, yeah, auditing you at the Scientology International Base, and you fall asleep. Did you get in trouble? Or I got in so happened? much trouble, and it's like. Might as well just slap David Miscavige <laughs> in the face. Slap him in the face. Well, I was on the night shift. So oh, when you're yeah. on the night shift, your body sort of – you're working all night long, but your body really wants to sleep. But then during the day, you're supposed to be sleeping, but your body wants to be awake. So no, Wait a minute. Wait. Stop. So you're working all night, and then you have to be all day with Tom Cruise? No, no. So what would happen no. is yeah. I would work all night. And then I would go to sleep when most people would be having breakfast. I'd go home and I'd go to sleep. And then I would get up like right before dinner time. And then I would come into the property and then I would eat dinner and then I would go do auditing with Tom. Okay. And so so I, mean, I would audit from right after dinner until, you know, late, a little bit late at night. And then when I was done with him, I would just go over and work until breakfast. And that was my sort of daily routine. Well, after this happened, it was like, no, 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 no more. My boss, who was the day shift person that did my job, well, she was assigned to the night shift, and I was assigned to the day shift. So now I would be able to go in session with Tom during the day, and they fed me. I got, the, I got all my meals were special. So everybody else is eating their slop or whatever, but my meal was a special meal. Yeah, and let me just say to, to people who don't know Scientology, Tom Cruise has you on an e-meter auditing you. You're holding the cans in your hand. One thing in the Church of Scientology, you have to be sessionable. That's right. Means you have to, you have to have had enough sleep and eat, and they do what's called a metabolism test before the, they, they start session. Yeah. So Tom did all that. He did the metab on you. Yeah, well, and the, 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 the me falling asleep thing was really just like, well, I did meta I did, he he would do the metabolism test before each session, but I was passing that. So it was sort of like, well, it just might probably just because he's on the night shift. So let's that just let's just so. switch him over to day shift. But the first time I went to session, I didn't pass that metabolism test. 
And that's when Tom is like, okay, let's get you some. Have you ever, do you take vitamins? I'm like, uh, no, dude, like I don't take vitamins. And he's like, oh my God, I can't believe you don't take vitamins. And I was just like, wow, this guy is like, he's really into the vitamins. Huh? And then he's like, well, what about bee pollen? Did you take any bee pollen today? And I'm literally like, bee pollen? Is this guy freaking nuts? Like, there's such a thing? You eat bee pollen? Like, not just, not honey, but bee pollen. Yeah, yeah, bee pollen. And I'm just like, no. And he's like, oh my gosh, you've got to eat bee pollen. That is the best way to be sessionable. And it may, like, this guy knows tricks (laughs) on how to pass the metabolism test. I was sort of like, this is, like, I've been in Scientology my whole life. I've never even heard heard a half this shit that he's talking about well if tom cruise wants bee pollen i'm making a note right here <laughs> bee pollen uh so then so did you finish auditing with tom yeah cruise? so so after a few weeks you know it was like okay good we're all done and then that's it i never saw the guy again until i think it was like 2004 so he just disappeared and 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 also during that time he wasn't in scientology like no 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 he had nothing to do with Scientology. Like when he got to – I think it was when he got to OT3 and, you know, Marty Rathbun or one of these cats who knows all his intricate auditing and life details would know like when exactly it was. But I think it was pretty much right, right after he did OT3 and he found out about, you know, the space aliens and body thetans. I think that's when he was like, oh, boy. And, and he's still with Nicole. So – this he he was gone. He was he was never at the property. Like and if he came there, we didn't know about it. So when he ditches Nicole and now he's with I think it was when he was with Penelope, that's when he sort of starts to get back in again. Right after no, the three- Nicole breakup, that's like that at that all that time was when he gets back in. And that's in I don't know, it's I think it's early two thousands, I wanna say, or late 90s so the, or whatever so scientology is able to recover him somehow yeah is this is this what's uh uh the so-called wife auditioning phase no no that happened no. that happened in, that's later yeah, that happened in 2004 which okay. which coincidentally was the next time that i had uh, i ended up seeing him uh we had done a lot of work on the property on new studios and editing bays and and Dave Miscavige wanted to show off, so Tom came to the property, and Tom was sending Dave, you know, rough cuts for trailers and uh, little scenes from The Last Samurai and all the stuff Tom Cruise was working on. It was just like, oh yeah, we're hearing about it, we know about it, blah 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 blah. It was like it was a big deal. We're gonna do a big birthday party for Tom Cruise on the sh- the free winds and all that stuff was happening and and now tom and dave are the best buddies in the whole world like the after marty sort of recovered tom cruise and got him back into the fold marty yeah. was the new handler okay okay and then marty sort of once marty's work was done then it was sort of handed off to tommy davis and then tommy davis was really just like tom cruise's you know, Scientology assistant. He was just with Tom all the time, everywhere, helping Tom with this, helping Tom with that. That's when we're making luxury SUVs and, uh, you know, redoing his hangers and all this stuff is happening in the mid 2000s. And, um, and that's, uh, 2000, late 2004 going into 2005 was the whole wife auditioning thing and all that stuff. But anyway, so earlier in 2004, Dave is trying to show off all this new stuff to Tom. Tom's walking through one of the auditing video editing bays. And that's when I saw him and he's, he's like, Oh, Hey, you know, he, it was like, Oh yeah, we remember in the sessions and Oh yeah, cool, 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 cool. I mean, it's been 14 years. He he spots me in a second. He knows exactly who I am. And then the funny thing is, is you fast forward a few years later and now I've already, I've left Scientology and I've got a lawsuit and my book is out and there's all these stories about, the Tom Cruise wife auditions and all this stuff. And I think it, one of Tom's spokes holes, I think it was Burt Fields or somebody that said, Tom Cruise doesn't remember this Mark Headley guy. And I got a real big, ch- I got a real big <laughs> chuckle out of that. Cause you know, Scientology and Hubbard, 
they often try to sell this idea that Scientologists have perfect recall and can remember not only this <laughs> current life, but past lives and millions and trillions of years ago. And here's this OT7 operating Phaeton level seven super being that's, you know, dedicated, the most dedicated Cylon that Dave Miscavige has known and blah, blah. And he can't even remember 15, when, 15, 20 years back when he spent weeks day after day with me. So I'm like, wow, dude, I remember. And I, I haven't even read Dianetics. Okay. Sounds like amnesia on the whole track. Yeah. And then there's also, there's also that video where, Tom Cruise says, yeah, and then they ask me, have you ever met an SP? And then he goes into that, you know, crazy cackle <laughs> laugh. And I'm yeah. like, met one. He freaking audited one for weeks on end. He knows oh. SPs. God, that is, that is so funny. He's surrounded by them. <laughs> <laughs> Swimming in an ocean of SPs. Well, yeah, the other thing is, and this is a big deal. Anyone who's on staff, who's been on staff or has been in the Sea Org knows this, like, absolutely. Whenever anyone blows Scientology, whether it's a staff member or a Sea Org member or a public, whatever auditor that was auditing that person, the person who blew, whatever the, whoever that person's auditor was, is freaking toast. You know, that it's basically oh, yeah. the auditor is the one who messed that person up. They, or they missed a withhold or they missed an overt or they, they did Scientology wrong or, you know, it's always the auditor is the one who gets the blame. And so I'm like, really? Like, if you asked anyone at the base, like, okay, who was that dude's auditor? Who gave that person, you know, the person who gave me the most auditing in Scientology, there's only one person who meets that criteria. That's Tom Cruise. So... It's like, good going, Tom. You not only have met a major SP, but you were the one who audited that SP. <laughs> and, Mark, this raises such a great point. It, and I was talking to my wife, Karen, and, you know, I asked Chris Shelton the other day, doesn't everyone in the Church of Scientology want to be an auditor? He said no. And then Karen added, and no, of course not. Who wants to be an auditor? Because if anyone blows, the auditor gets you know, his or her head on a pike. Yep. Why would you want to be an auditor? Uh, if you're going to get that, people are leaving the church in regular numbers. Auditors must be RPF to every day, but you make a good point, you know, so Tom Cruise audited you and yet you turn out to be an SP. Yeah. Eh, like whatever. Well, has he met yeah. one? Yeah. He audited one. He was working with one. He, you know, regardless of whatever he says or what he remembers or whatever, it's sort of like he gets the special treatment. So it's like, okay, fine. So one of your two PCs turned into a major SP. So there was another guy he was auditing as well. And that guy is the security chief of the ant base. So oh, was that, Jackson Moorhead? No, no, no. It's a, he's still there now. His name is Kevin yeah. Catano. I don't know if he's still the security chief, but he was when I left. He was the security chief of the Ant Base. So it was this Kevin guy and me. Because we were both people that had no Scientology auditing. So it was sort of like, okay, good, these are the two uh guys he's gonna audit it. And so yeah, so one guy was ended up being the security chief and the other guy ended up blowing. <laughs> wow. Uneven results to say the least. Exactly. Very very uneven results. Now, in this same period, so you're, uh, which is, it's just fascinating to talk about Tom Cruise. Obviously, the rules don't apply to him. And, uh, you know, I saw him last night on uh, The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. Yeah. He looked good. Yeah, I mean, you know, was, I, mean I don't, see, that's the other thing. I, I really do think that there was a certain period where Tom had no idea what was going on. And he sort of kind of was, you know, he was sold this this bill of goods like, oh, this, we're going to help you with this. We're going to help you with that. We're going to help you. Obviously, they wrecked his career and his life. I mean, here's a guy who wanted to get into Scientology, you know, because he wanted to be have a good relationship with his wife and he wanted to have children and this whole thing. OK, he's on. Divorce, I think he's been divorced three times now. He's got one kid he doesn't even have custody of. She's off in the East Coast with her mom. Um, he's got an, uh, his first ex-wife. I have no idea what the deal is with him and Mimi, but I don't think he and her are talking every day. Nicole and him are completely estranged. And now these kind of there's these two adopted kids who are caught in the middle. And his 
kind of movie careers, you know, had its ups and downs. And obviously he's had a lot of public relations issues with, you know, jumping on couches and, you know, whatever. But it got to the point where he was offering to Dave, uh, this is according to Dave Miscavige, that he was offering to come up there and bust some heads for Dave because the, the imp base guys weren't listening and doing what Dave wanted. And Tom was like, well, I can come up there and help you out if you need it. You know, and this is Dave telling us this. So it got to a point where he's not he's not the duped, you know, cele- insecure celebrity guy. Um, he's the now he's the teen matinee idol that's sort of like Dave's buddy and knows exactly what's going on. But I think now he might be in a little bit of damage control. Um, trying to sort of resurrect his career and do whatever he's doing. I mean, obviously the guy doesn't, he doesn't have to work. He's got enough money. He could just, you know, bow out of that industry altogether. Nobody would care and he would be able to live comfortably for the rest of his life. But he, 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 uh, <clears throat> he loves to act. He's a great actor. And, uh, you know, the, I think the, uh, the key mistakes, he, he has the greatest, you know, agent in the world and uh he he gets rid of his agent pat kingsley yeah and then he gets a very inexperienced his sister leander that takes over his career this was all at miscavige's behest and people don't appreciate the kind of isolation the kind of isolation into which scientology can put you movie stars are, are already tend to be isolated and have handlers and pr people uh so David Miscavige spent all this tax-exempt religious dollars to create a bubble for Tom, and and Tom got very radicalized for a period. Yeah. This is why Sumner Redstone fired him off the Paramount lot. Sumner Redstone said, I don't think we want to have anyone who effectuates creative suicide. Yeah. He did go through his period, then he went, you know, on Oprah several years later to try to say, yeah, that was a period, it's over with. And I will tell you, you know, Katie Holmes... Katie Holmes basically had to blow out of that marriage. Yeah, I mean, highly engineered. She, whatever she's got that Nicole didn't have, and that there's a lot of speculation on what that is. I don't think we need to go into that here, but whatever she had, she owned the hell out of that dude. I mean, it was done it, in a week. It was done. She had full custody. Da, 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 da. I mean, obviously, no one's saying what, what happened. No one's saying what went down, but. When Nicole tried to do that same thing, she didn't get the kids. She just – it's just like, oh, she, Nicole knows what she did. Poof, it's over. And this time it was a completely different thing, and it was also this sort of thing which is on the tail end of the Scientology crazy period. So it was sort of like he's not going to get treated the same as he got treated last time, or there's a different situation with, with Katie – that obviously uh, we we're not privy to, but whatever happened, it was it was no doubt that Katie was taking the kid, and and uh, you know that's the end of it. And Tom's just going to basically have to do whatever he can uh, to make it all work out, and you know he can see her when he wants to see her. And and then I think you know sure. he didn't end up seeing her for a few months. The next time he ended up seeing her. So there's all this, you know, crazy stuff happening. But I think now, I think that he's sort of pulling back a little bit from the, the Scientology. As I don't know what's happening behind the scenes, but for one, he doesn't talk about Scientology at all. Like it doesn't. No period. Well, three things come to mind. In the Nicole divorce, it came out later that Anthony Pelicano was involved in wiretapping. He actually got some conversations. Now, now Burt Fields, you know, was really straight up with the FBI. He was exonerated, and and then they had a with Katie Holmes. There was a prenup, and her father's a divorce lawyer. Yeah. So they just exercised those provisions on what was looked like a surgical strike. Mark, I think Tom Cruise has paid for his sins. He really has. He's made some mistakes, and he paid hell for them. I'm glad to see him back working. I hope he's backed off of you know that fanatical. Thing that it, and he, like I said, he looked great last night. Uh, w- wish him all the best, but it does show you life at the top of Scientology is not what it's cracked up to be. It can be extremely difficult to be 
in the clutches of the Church of Scientology. And it, that should serve as a warning to people who think they have anything to offer because they don't. What they will offer you is control. Absolutely. And a high level of control you don't want. And I, my opinion was always just my opinion that Katie Holmes was really overwhelmed by the amount of control. Yeah, hold on. That we have I have a, uh, a hailstorm that's... Uh Oh, that's what we're hearing in back, a hailstorm? <laughs> yeah. I was like, at, at first I was like, I wonder if they can hear it, but then I'm like, I can definitely tell you they can hear this. Cause it's... Well, it appears that the very large, sudden, and unexpected, very dramatic hailstorm at the Headley's home has wiped out our internet connection. And as this is internet radio, we are through for today's show. Uh, we thank you for listening, and we want to thank our guest, Mark Headley, author of Alone for Good, Behind the Iron Curtain of Scientology. It's available on Amazon. It's available on Kindle. Recommend you read it if you haven't, or give it as a gift to a friend who needs to read it. For Surviving Scientology Radio, this is Jeffrey Augustine, and as always, we'll be in very good touch.